Our ship is sinking fast beneath the waves. It's such a storm that we cannot live in small boats. One boat has already gone below with our human cargo. God let us all live through this. We struck an iceberg in a blinding snowstorm and floated two hours. Now it's 3.20 a.m. by my watch, and the great ship is dead level with the sea. Goodbye, all. At 2 a.m. on March 4th, 1893, the British steamer SS Coventry came upon an overturned lifeboat in the North Atlantic. Later that day, they would find a second, floating upright, almost completely swamped but in good condition with its sail and mast still intact. The two derelict boats were from the White Star Line livestock carrier, the SS Neuronic. They were found only a few miles from where the Titanic would sink less than 20 years later. The two lifeboats were the only verified trace of the SS Neuronic that would ever be found. At the time, the incident was a confounding mystery that sparked a small media sensation. Now the lost ship is just a nearly forgotten historical footnote. What happened to the brand new steamship and the 74 souls on board remains one of the great mysteries of the White Star Line. By the early 1890s, the White Star Line, still under the supervision of Thomas Ismay, had well established itself as an innovative Atlantic shipping line. Their latest passenger liners, the Teutonic and the Majestic, both launched in 1889, took turns capturing the Blue Riband for the fastest Atlantic crossing in 1891. They were the first White Star Liners to be constructed without square ribbed sails, and they garnered international acclaim, particularly impressing Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. His country would soon begin construction on the Kaiser class of four funnel liners that would spark a period of fierce competition for Atlantic dominance between the European powers. The White Star Line's interests extended well beyond their premier passenger liners and included a fleet of lesser-known vessels that serviced the lucrative Atlantic livestock trade. The SS Neuronic, like most White Star Line ships, was constructed at Harlan & Wolfe in Belfast, Ireland. She was launched May 26, 1892, and completed on July 11th. She was a well-equipped and modern vessel for the time, designed to also accommodate a small number of passengers to maximize profits. She was powered by twin reciprocating engines that drove twin propellers to achieve a cruising speed of 13 knots. She was 470 feet long and 6,594 tons. For comparison, the Teutonic, built only a few years before at Harland and Wolf, was one of the largest, most advanced ships of the time. She came in at 582 feet and 9,984 tons. So while the Neuronic was certainly not a record breaker, she was a fairly large ship for the time. Her maiden voyage took place on July 15, 1892, sailing from Liverpool to New York. She sailed without incident for the first few months of her career. The SS Neuronic departed Liverpool for her final voyage on February 11, 1893. She was commanded by Captain William Roberts, a veteran of the White Star Line with 20 years of experience serving the company. She had a total of 74 men on board made up of 50 crewmen, 14 cattlemen, and 10 horse traders. The voyage was a routine one. She carried 3,572 tons of general cargo and 1,017 tons of Welsh coal. After dropping off her harbor pilot at Point Linus, Wales, the SS Neuronic was never seen again. It was somewhat normal at the time for cargo ships to arrive behind schedule, but after a few days, worry began to grow. The story first broke in the New York Times on March 2nd, 19 days after the ship left Liverpool. Her longest trip at this point had been 11 days and her sister ship, the slower SS Bovic, had arrived in New York that day after leaving Liverpool six days after the Neuronic departed. Ships on the same route reported heavy seas, gale force winds, and snow. When the SS Coventry arrived in port later that month with the news of the abandoned lifeboats, it was clear the ship had probably been lost. There was intense media speculation at the time over the fate of the missing freighter with stories of potential boiler explosions, getting carried off course, and wives driven mad by grief. Seriously. But then, the bottles began to appear. On March 3rd in Bay Ridge, New York, a bottle was found with a message inside. It read, February 19th, 1893. Neuronic sinking. All hand praying. God have mercy on us. The message was signed L. Winslow. Then, on March 30th, in Ocean View, Virginia, another message washed ashore in a champagne bottle. It was the most detailed, reading, 3.10 a.m., February 19th. 
SS Neuronic at sea. To who picks this up, report when you find this to our agents, if not heard of before, that our ship is sinking fast beneath the waves. It's such a storm that we can never live in the small boats. One boat has already gone with her human cargo below. God let all of us live through this. We were struck by an iceberg in a blinding snowstorm and floated two hours. Now at 3.20 a.m. by my watch and the great ship is dead level with the sea. Report to the agents at Broadway, New York, M. Kersey and Company. Goodbye, all. It was signed, John Olson, Cattleman. The next message was found in the Irish Channel on June of that year. It read, Struck iceberg, sinking fast, neuronic. This message was signed, Young. The final message was found September 18th, floating in the Mercy River. It contained two strips of wool and read, All hands lost, neuronic, no time to say more. The message was signed with just a T. An inquiry was held by the British Board of Trade at St. George's Hall in Liverpool. The ship's design and cargo manifest were reviewed and it was quickly determined that a sudden shift in cargo wasn't to blame for the disaster. The harbor pilot was interviewed and reported nothing out of the ordinary while he was briefly on board the ship. Beyond that, the board had little to work with. There was speculation from the captain of another White Star Line ship, the Runic, that it was possible that the ship's engines could suffer a catastrophic malfunction that would result in one of her pistons shooting down through the hole, causing her to sink almost immediately. Real company man right here. The Board of Trade was quick to dismiss the bottle messages and iceberg theory. They claimed that there was no ice present despite reports from other ships in the area that they had encountered ice near where the incident likely occurred. There is, however, reason to question the authenticity of the bottle messages. For one, none of the signed names, L. Winsel, John Olson, or Young, appear on the crew or passenger lists. Once the story first appeared in the papers, the missing ship was a big story. So it's suspicious that the first message was found in New York only one day after the story first broke in the New York Times. The White Star Line also dismissed the second bottle as a hoax because they felt it was impossible for the bottle to reach the spot where it was found. But debris from ships in the area have been found along the eastern seaboard of the United States throughout the years. Even if it's unlikely, it's not impossible. While there's reason to doubt the bottles, there's also reason to believe they could be authentic. The names don't match the manifest, but it was very common at the time for passenger lists to be pretty inaccurate. Even the Titanic, 20 years later, had 33 mistakes on her passenger lists. So it's not inconceivable that someone gave a different name, joined the crew last minute, or simply made a mistake. The first two bottles also list the exact same date, February 19th. Based on the neuronic speed and date of departure, she would likely have been in the area where her lifeboats were found at around the same date. The second bottle also listed several other specific details and even correctly named the White Star Line agent in New York. So if it was a fake, the pranksters really did their homework. But if the bottles were hoaxes, and the ship didn't strike an iceberg in a snowstorm, what happened to her? And if they're real, why were no bodies or debris found? After survivors from the Titanic disaster were rescued from Collapsible A, the lifeboat was set adrift with three bodies. After drifting for a month, the boat was recovered by the RMS Oceanic. The three bodies were still on board the small boat. In fact, the last bodies recovered from the Titanic were discovered a full six weeks after the tragedy. So why were none found from the Neuronic? The last theory, and definitely the craziest one, came a decade later in 1903. A bomb was planted on the Cunard Line's RMS Umbria by a political terrorist who went by the name Gessler Rousseau. The bomb plot failed, and when he was arrested, newspapers claimed that a slip of paper was found in his room that read, the destruction of the neuronic was complete. Rousseau is completely forgotten now, but he was somewhat notorious at the time and known to target British ships. But aside from being pretty bad at making bombs that actually worked, Rousseau was in America at the time of the neuronic disaster, which would make it pretty hard for him to board the ship in Liverpool. The story is likely a case of media sensationalism, they even spell neuronic wrong in the headline, which is kind of fun. The thing that strikes me about the neuronic mystery is not so much trying to figure out how it happened. We can gather that something went terribly wrong that caused the ship to sink with all on board. That's not all that mysterious. The thing that I get caught up on is the lonely terror of the situation. Knowing that your ship is sinking in the middle of the night miles from anyone who can help. How it must have felt for the relatives of the 74 men on board. 
It's one thing to lose a loved one, it's another to always wonder what actually happened to them. No one even sent a search party after the ship went missing. The White Star Line altered the Teutonic's route slightly after the incident to sail through the area where the Neuronic was thought to have been lost. But that was it. They just asked another ship to keep an eye out. It's hard to imagine such indifference today. But after all, the 74 men weren't paying passengers, they were just replaceable employees. The Neuronic disaster happened five years before the Marconi company began producing systems like the one installed on the Titanic. In that time, if you ran into trouble, your only hope was signaling a nearby ship, or survive in a tiny lifeboat, which in heavy seas would be almost completely impossible. One of my favorite stories from the Titanic disaster is what happened on Saturday, April 13, 1912, the day before she struck the iceberg. That evening, while Chief Telegraph Operator John Phillips was at work sending messages, the Marconi machine suddenly stopped working. It was standard procedure at the time that if something went wrong with the equipment, the operators were not supposed to try and fix it. They were to wait until the ship reached shore where a company technician could properly service the equipment. Phillips and his assistant Harold Bride ignored the rules and spent five hours working late into the night to fix the equipment on their own. It's terrifying to imagine what would have happened if they hadn't fixed the machine when they did. The Titanic sank in two hours and 40 minutes. What if when the massive liner went down, the Carpathia wasn't racing to the scene? What if no one knew she was in trouble? That's exactly what happened to the crew of the SS Neuronic. When whatever went wrong with the ship, whether it was a sudden engine malfunction or a collision with an iceberg in a blinding snowstorm, all they could do was wait for their ship to sink beneath them, leaving them alone in the churning icy waters. No one would know what happened to them. No one would know their state of mind in those final moments. They were just gone, without a trace.